Okay. So, questions, uh, doubts, comments from the last lectures? Okay, so let's uh, recall briefly what we have done so far. So last time we studied various inequalities between the smooth Remy divergences. Okay, so we uh, singled out two of them at the two ends of the Remy spectrum with respect to alpha. So at one end was the D epsilon zero, okay, the smooth uh, Remy entropy of order zero. And we defined several other uh, divergences, and they're all uh, roughly the same. So we will use the D epsilon min definition most of the time because it has all the good properties. It satisfies data processing, and it satisfies continuity. Okay, okay but uh, some proofs are easier done in one of these other uh, uh, definitions. So we will keep all of them around, but we know they are roughly the same. Then uh, we saw. Uh, the result that the Rene entropies of order alpha for alpha strictly less than one, they behave roughly like D epsilon min or roughly like D epsilon zero. Okay. And uh, the Rene entropies for alpha bigger than one behave roughly like D epsilon max. So D epsilon max was another word for D epsilon infinity. Okay. So they behave roughly like that. This one. And uh, then we also saw a result which relates at two ends that D epsilon max is roughly D one minus epsilon min. So the, so in D one minus epsilon min, the error is very large. The error is one minus epsilon. So the success probability is epsilon. So of course, as the error probability increases, uh, the smooth D min quantity increases. There's monotonicity with respect to the error parameter. And uh, as I increase the error from epsilon to one minus epsilon, the D min will go and become something like D epsilon max. Okay. So, so there's a relation uh, between them also, but uh, it involves changing epsilon to one minus epsilon. Now D1, as you can see, has been ignored from these two uh, theorems. So D1, which is equal to the Shannon relative entropy is special. So it's at the borderline, as you can see from here. And usually we do not deal with a smoother version. And uh, it is important because it is the asymptotic IID limit for resource use of all the Rene entropies, including that extremes D epsilon min and D epsilon max. Okay. So we will, we will see uh, more and more stronger versions of this comment. There is the asymptotic IID limit for resource use. And lastly, we said uh, we listed the Rene divergences that are useful in practice. So D epsilon zero is useful. It's at one end of the Rene spectrum, and in, this is the quantity that will control all our packing arguments. Then D half we saw was uh, related uh, exactly to the fidelity, which is a useful measure of distinguishability between probability distributions. So that's why D half is interesting. D one, of course, is a Shannon relative entropy. A lot of theory around it, borderline case, asymptotic IID limit, so it's very important. D two is also important in some applications. So applications which study collision probability. So suppose I take uh, two independent samples from the same probability distribution P, what is the probability that the uh, samples X and X prime are equal? Okay. So that turns out to be H2, the Rene 2 entropy, which can be derived from D2. So for this kind of collision results, D2 is important. And then of course, uh, D epsilon infinity, the other end of the Rene spectrum. So this is important. This controls all our covering arguments as we can see. So uh, any doubts, questions about this material that we've covered so far? Okay. So we'll do some new stuff. So as we saw in the last uh, slide, and I emphasize that D1 is special, okay? In particular, I mean, D1 is at the borderline, doesn't fit into this. So D1, you cannot say D1 looks like D epsilon zero, or you cannot say that D1 looks like uh, D epsilon max, so it's at the borderline. So I would like to relate D1 to D A epsilon zero or D epsilon min, let us say. And I also would like to relate it to D epsilon max. Okay. So this is done by a, a theorem called the substrate theorem. Okay. So the nomenclature is historical, but this is what it says. So 
there are two parts to the substrate theorem. This is the first part. So the first part gives an upper bound on d epsilon min in terms of d1. Okay, so this looks like this. And uh, here the numerator is the binary entropy function. So if the entropy of a two-point probability distribution, probability of head is uh, epsilon, let's say, and probability of tails is 1 minus epsilon. Okay, so this is the entropy. And uh, it, it is trivially upper bounded by 1. So often we can work with this upper bound. So let's prove it. So let n be the vector that achieves the optimum in the definition of d epsilon. Okay. So what was uh, d epsilon mean? Let's recall. So I have to uh, design a certain test. So that so the test is captured by this vector n. Okay. And uh, what is this test, or what is uh, this vector n capturing? This defines a private coin algorithm. Okay. And uh, the sim the symbol x is accepted by the algorithm n with some probability n x. So th this is can be any number between 0 and 1. Okay. Now, from this private curl algorithm, I can get a test with Boolean outcome, with outcome 0 or 1, accept or reject. Okay. So, <clears throat> so uh, recall, so, so what is this test? For the symbol x, I uh, give the outcome 1, or I give the outcome x with probability mx. Okay. So in other words, so what is the probability that this test accepts the probability distribution P? So probability MP equal to 1. So it's nothing but the dot product of the vectors M and P, right? So this is summation Px Mx, OK? So the symbol X is generated probability Px if I'm under the distribution P, and it is accepted with probability Mx. So I get summation over X, Mx Px, which is M dot P, which I've seen before. And uh, the probability of accepting Q is M dot Q. Similarly, so d epsilon min says that I have to find an optimizing vector here, and we know that the optimizing vector will actually satisfy uh, uh, the, the probability of accepting the ideal hypothesis. Okay, remember this is asymmetric hypothesis testing, so the probability of accepting the ideal hypothesis uh, is satisfied with equality. So m dot p is exactly equal to one minus epsilon. So the definition of d epsilon min had a greater than or equal to here. But uh, we know that the optimizer will actually saturate this uh, uh, constraint. It will be equal to 1 minus epsilon. And the optimizer minimizes the probability of accepting the imposter hypothesis Q. So the m dot Q will be minimized. And that mi uh, minimized quantity is what we call d epsilon. This is the definition. So this is just the definition of d epsilon. So now we can apply data processing inequality for d epsilon. Okay. Uh, sorry, we'll apply data processing inequality for D1, the Shannon related vector. So start with the D1 uh, uh, Shannon relative entropy between P and Q. Apply the test M. So the outcome of the test is 0 or 1. So what I get is a probability distribution on the set 0, 1. Okay. So I get a certain probability distribution if I apply the test on P. I get another probability distribution if I apply the test on Q. Okay. On uh, so so these are probability distributions on a two-point set. So data processing says that uh, uh, the left-hand side is less than the right-hand side. Now let's look at the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is a two-point probability distribution. So the probability of outcome 1 is m dot p and m dot q, as we argued here. So this is, I'm just writing the Shannon relative entropy formula. So this is uh, corresponding to outcome uh, 1. And this is corresponding outcome zero, but note that the, I should have put log one minus m dot p divided by one minus m dot p. So if I'd done that, then I would have got equality out here. But I made this an inequality because I've ignored uh, one minus m dot q in the denominator. So this is a positive quantity because one minus m dot q is a quantity less than or equal to one. Okay, so the so the, uh, so this is a positive quantity. And uh, if I ignore it, I get this inequality. Okay. So, so I have this chain of inequalities. Okay. Is, is this clear to everybody? Okay. This chain of inequalities. OK. So now I just move things to the right hand side. So uh, again, I'm a bit confused about this private algorithm M. Like it, it receives input 
x distributed according to either p or q right and okay. so either accept or reject yes. and the, the randomness is uh, like so what private coins are the so the, the, the private coins are used to accept symbol x with probability mx right mx is something between 0 and 1 uh, okay okay yeah okay. yeah so so this is what is different from earlier hypothesis test for likelihood ratio all of them would have said for for that mx would be either zero or it would be one okay but uh, it turns out that the best hypothesis testing can be done by taking mx to be between zero and one because I mean, that is precisely what private coin algorithms can do and uh, you can uh, quickly define the lp for that okay. and that's the epsilon so we have discussed this uh, the last time. The, the other quantities the other uh, uh, variants of d epsilon mean would, would have used mx to be either zero or one depending on the x okay. but here we are allowing uh, a continuum between zero and one. okay so any other questions okay so we just plug this in remember m dot q is related to this uh, D epsilon. We we plug this in, move things over the right hand side, and we get this. Okay. So this completes the first inequality, and then I'm just upper bounding the binary entropy by one for the second inequality. So this completes the proof. Of okay. So now here's a check which you can do at home, which is very instructive. Show that the upper bound can the upper bound here can be almost checked. Okay. So uh, by that I mean that. Show that you can cook up the problem sorry, distribution. Sorry, sorry, can you say that again? I'm I'm saying it. Yeah. So by that I mean that you can cook up probability distributions P and Q so that D epsilon min indeed looks like uh, D1. Okay. I mean, take a small epsilon. So this one minus epsilon is close to one. That's not going to change things much. And similarly, H epsilon is close to zero. That's also not going to change life much. So the main thing here is D1. So I'm saying that cook up probability distributions P and Q such that D epsilon min looks roughly like D1. So that's saying that upper bound can be almost. Okay. So that's the first thing you, uh, you should cook up. So this will give you a, a feeling about uh, these uh, smooth one shot uh, entropy quantities. So show that uh, D epsilon min can indeed look like D1. I mean, the upper bound is almost tight. And you might be wondering why there is no lower bound. Okay. So the answer is D epsilon min can be arbitrarily smaller than D1. So that's the second check. Cook up probability distributions P and Q where D epsilon min is arbitrarily smaller than D1. So really there's no lower bound here in terms of D1. Okay. So these are two checks uh, I leave to you do. So in, in that sense, this uh, inequality cannot be improved. Any questions about it? So let's move on to part two of the substrate theorem, which relates D1 to D epsilon max. So first of all, D1 is less than or equal to D epsilon max. So this is uh, uh, trivial, which you have already seen. This is the monotonicity of the Rene entropy with respect to alpha. Okay. The non-trivial part is the second inequality. So this says that D epsilon max is uh, less than D1 by epsilon. This plus one is not uh, very important. So. Uh, uh, it is less than or equal to D1 by epsilon. Okay. So, uh, so let's try to prove this. For the second inequality, let's define this subset of the sample space S. So S is the set of those symbols X where the ratio Px by Qx, the, the likelihood ratio, is larger than 2 to the right hand side. So this is the right hand side, this full thing, D1 plus 1 divided by epsilon. So this is the RHS. So I'm uh, Picking out those symbols x where the likelihood ratio is larger than 2 to the RHS. Now, let n be the Boolean outcome test that accepts x if x lies in the set s and rejects other one. So, this is a 0 1 test. All x's which lie in s are accepted with probability 1. All x's that are outside s are uh, accepted with probability 0. So, it's a 0 1 test. So, now I'm going to apply data processing to d1 again. Okay. So I start off with uh, D1, uh, Shannon relative entropy between P and Q. I apply my, uh, this Boolean outcome test. In fact, this is a deterministic test, okay? 
So I get a probability distribution supported on two points, zero and one. Okay. So MP is the probability distribution that I get uh, for this test when I feed it samples from P. And similarly, I have MQ. So this is the data processing inequality. And now we are going to write down D1, just like before. Okay, but we are going to drop terms and make it an inequality. So D1 is a uh, two point, I mean, these are two point probability distributions. So how do you write the D1? So this is the, this is for the outcome one. Okay, this term is for the outcome one and this term is for the outcome zero. Again, there should have been log probability MP equal to zero divided by probability NQ equal to zero. Okay, but uh, I'm ignoring it. That's a positive quantity. So I get uh, inequality out. Same like Okay, so now let's uh, simplify things. Okay, so I know, so so what is uh, n p equal to one? Uh, I mean, when does n return one if x lies in s? Okay, so now what happens, what happens for this guy? So look at those symbols x that lie in this set s. So the probability of s under p is something, so whatever it is, is less than one. I don't know. There's some probability PS. And then I ask, what is the probability of the set S under Q? But note the following. QS is less than 2 to the minus RHS times PS. So let me write this explicitly. Is this comment clear? Why QS is less than PS times 2 to the minus RHS? Okay. Just follow. R RHS is uh, D, uh, D, uh, D max epsilon. Or, or, RHS or D1 is this. D1 PQ over epsilon. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, we are proving the second inequality. So it is the RHS on the second inequality. Right? I mean, the first inequality was trivial. Uh, so uh, these distributions P and Q, they are distributions over uh, some uh, over some uh, set sample space of which s is a subset yes so th so there's an underlying sample space x p and q are distributions on the same x okay and s is a subset of x okay is that clear yeah 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 uh, okay. yeah. yeah so the point uh, the point here being for every symbol in s Individually, the probability qx is less than px times 2 to the minus rhs. Okay, so you just sum over all the symbols in s and I'll get this. qs is less than this. Right? But ps is just the probability mp is equal to 1. Uh, probability mq equal to 1 is qs. So I know that this ratio okay, is uh, greater than uh, 2 to the rhs and I've taken logs, so I just get the rhs out. So I get a further inequality. Okay. So, uh, this ratio probability MP equal to one divided by probability MQ equal to one. This ratio is uh, lower bounded by two to the RHS. So you have to get this.
Ah, hello. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So I hope uh, this is clear. Uh, my QS is less than this. So then uh, I can infer this uh, inequality out here. And the second term here, I move to the right hand side. I get out. Here. So uh, note that this quantity, I mean, this quantity is some probability uh, P times uh, log P. Okay, so uh, I know where it is maximized. It's maximized when P is equal to one by uh, E, one by the base of the natural logarithm. And uh, you can evaluate what it is, but uh, I'm doing an even cruder upper bound. I, I'm upper bounding this by one. Okay. okay. So once I do that, uh, so, okay, so this is uh, the plus one out here. And uh, so, uh, I, uh, so I, I just have a very quick, quick question. So in the asymptotic ID setting, this, that suppose that P and Q were uh, product distributions of some sort, okay. Uh, in 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 that case, this uh, probability m p equal to zero that uh, the 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 complement of s is that mm. not a small probability set? Hmm. So well, the I'm, I mean it may may not be, but I mean how uh, how, how does it matter? Oh, okay, no, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean the. I mean, yeah, it's not exactly your sort of name and Pearson except this rule due to the RH, RHS could be really large. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. The name and Pearson is uh, like the hypothesis test. Okay. And actually, it is, I mean, even closer to this quantity. This D epsilon S. Okay. Name and Pearson sets a threshold. And then I look at... Uh, the subset, the, the plus set, where uh, the ratio of probabilities is larger than the threshold, larger than two to the lambda. Okay, and uh, this, so Neyman Pearson is really this. Okay. okay, okay, but as I said, the best thing one can do for hypothesis testing is D epsilon mean. But then anyway, they are all related, so this we all did last. Okay, so Neyman Pearson gives this exponent D epsilon s. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. But actually, I mean. Uh, the in the I mean the proper analysis will give us the, uh, the op optimal one which is the epsilon win. Okay, but oh. they're, they're all I mean closely related like this. So this Sano's and, theorem, which sort of gives I'm coming this. to that. Okay. Sano's theorem. Yeah, yeah. So we are going. Uh, you are going to see all the, the uh, standard theorems of IID information theory, but done uh, according to the book. Okay. And many cases will improve. That. Yeah. So there was also a comment about uh, Stein's lemma, basically the same thing, Sanoff's theorem. So we are all coming to that. Okay. So, and another thing which I said, I mean, all these uh, quantities in the asymptotic ID limit, like Neyman Pearson also goes to asymptotic ID limit. So all of this in the asymptotic ID limit approach uh, the Shannon relative entropy. Okay, so that sort of fudges things out, but I mean, if you work at the one shot level, we know exactly which is which. Okay. And we have a much clearer picture. And often, I mean, the, the, that will become clear. Uh, I mean, as the course proceeds, or if you look at the very first lecture, Neha, I had already made it clear that even for the Shannon's noiseless source coding theorem, the, a simple one-shot analysis does better than that. Okay. And actually gives that uh, tight answer. I mean, tight answer means the answer, not even plus minus one bit. The answer. And, and and we realize, I mean, why it is better than the uh, Shannon type analysis with typical sets, which is not tight. Uh -huh. okay. okay, so, yes. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, this will look similar to things that we have done, but yeah, we are just, I mean, cutting away the frills of asymptotic. Okay, so, yeah, in any case, I mean, whatever this uh, probability np equal to zero is, I mean, this quantity is less than uh, one. So we just plug it in and then we just simplify things and we conclude that probability of uh, np uh, being one is less than epsilon. So which means that uh, if I look at uh, the condition for d epsilon max, so what was the condition for the d epsilon max? I mean, the theorem of d epsilon max. So look at the, uh, so d epsilon max says that you fix a threshold lambda. So uh, for, for this part, for this part of the math, 
my threshold lambda is this RHS. So you fix a threshold lambda, okay, uh, which is the RHS. Now look at the positive set. So what is the positive set? The positive set, uh, which was plus in the early notation, it is just this set. This is the set where the ratio is larger than two to the threshold, two to the RHS for RHS. Okay. So now over this positive set, you look at uh, this objective function. Okay. So I sum over points in the positive set, sum over points in S of this quantity. Okay. So this quantity should, should be less than epsilon. So that was a uh, characterization of the epsilon max. But I know that whatever this is, this is less than uh, summation over x, px. I'm just dropping the second thing out here, which, uh, which is just this quantity, which is less than epsilon. So by, uh, remember D epsilon max had a minimization over uh, all thresholds out here. So whatever it is, D epsilon max is less than this RHS, which concludes the proof. Is this proof clear? Okay, I'm suddenly very confused. So this probability that MP equal to one, what are the sources of randomness? One source of randomness is that if your point falls within S, then M accepts it with probability one. So it has a trivial coin. That's one source. But uh, this MP notation means that the points themselves are being generated from the distribution yeah. of P, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. okay. So, so, so here the test is a deterministic test. If it's in S, except with probability one, if it is in complement of S, except with probability zero. So, so that the, means that the probability of S under the distribution P is very yes. small. It's at yes. most epsilon. Yes, okay. okay. That is yeah. Good. Any further doubts? Okay. So again, go home and check that both upper and lower bounds above can be almost saturated. So in other words, you can cook up probability distributions P and Q such that D epsilon max looks like D1. And you can cook up some other probability distributions P and Q where D epsilon max looks like the right-hand side, D1 by epsilon. Okay. So in that sense, this inequality cannot be improved. Okay. So this, again, I mean, I highly recommend that you do this exercise so that you get a feel of probability distributions and one shot quantities and you see which way they are turning. Okay, let's go. Okay, so Neha likes Sanov's theorem. Ishan was talking of Stein's lemma last time. So let's come to that. Okay, so the question we have is P and Q are two probability distributions in the same sample space X. Okay, and uh, let S be a subset of X. The question is, can we lower bound uh, the probability of S under Q, which I'm calling QS, in terms of PS and other properties of Q? Now, if P is close to Q, then of course I have this uh, simple lower bound coming from triangle inequality. Okay. So QS is lower bounded by PS minus half the uh, L1 distance. Okay. But what happens if the, uh, let us say the uh, Shannon relative entropy of P with respect to Q is large and, uh, the, and the probability PS, let us say small, what happens in this case? Okay. So in this case, often what happens is the L1 distance is close to two. Okay, by large means it doesn't be so large. Let us say D1 is something like 10. I mean, my probability distribution is on a sample space of size n, n maybe is uh, one lakh. Okay, and uh, so D1, I mean, D1 can be very large. And uh, I mean, D1 of the order of log of one lakh is uh, not unthinkable. Okay, but uh, I'm. I'm but I'm not even talking of uh, such large D1. I just think D1 is a small, uh, small uh, constant, like two, three, 10 maybe. In this case, already the L1 distance can be close to two. And so this, this lower bounding technique by L1 cannot be used. So the question is, suppose D1 is large, but finite, and PS is a small non-zero. Can you guarantee that QS is still positive? So I will pause the recording, this is 12.7. So I'll pause it for uh, around uh, five minutes. So 12.12, 12, we'll come back. And uh, like you're all experts in information theory. So 
I mean, you already know enough rules to solve this by now. So let's see if you can uh, uh, give some guarantee that QS is still possible. Ha, Varun, so just uh, tell your solution again. Yeah. No, I was saying that it, it should be strictly positive because if D1 of P and Q is strictly less than infinity, then the support of uh, Q is going to be a superset of the support of P. So it can't be that uh, P has non-zero volume in S and Q doesn't. Correct, uh, right. yes. And the Absolutely. worst case scenario is, yeah. Yeah, you can look at the worst case. So yeah, so now we'll just uh, make this more quantitative. Okay, yes. So let's give a name. Let's call, uh, so PS is some positive quantity. Uh, so let's give a name. Epsilon is one minus PS. No, uh, now we'll use the definition of D epsilon mean and the substrate theorem. Okay. So which says the following, this is the one short Stein's lower bound. So, so uh, suppose PS is a positive constant. Okay. The reason I emphasize the positive constant is that even you apply it in the asymptotic IID case, okay, I don't want the, the probability of P to start shrinking with uh, N, where N is the number of copies you're using. Okay. I want the probability of P to be a constant in that sense. Okay. So anyway, so, uh, so that is what this uh, statement means. PS, which I'm calling one minus epsilon, is a positive constant. Then, uh, of course, uh, QS is larger than uh, the D epsilon mean of P with respect to Q. Okay, just by definition of the epsilon. And we'll use substrate theorem part one, which will say this. So, so uh, finally, I mean, it boils down to support of P contains support of Q, but this just makes it quantitative. Okay. So, I mean, you can derive the same thing by data processing and all. Uh, essentially, you, you'll be reproving uh, things like this. Okay. But yes, I mean, uh, the reason I gave it is that. Uh, make use of uh, uh, theorems. I mean, this theorem doesn't look all that great, but it has nice consequences. Okay. So, so the, uh, it gives a non-trivial lower bound on And in fact, this argument can be extended. So I think uh, several classes earlier, there was a discussion, uh, I think Ishan probably initiated and Hare Krishan was also there. Uh, about um, uh, the connection between relative entropy and L1, the pin curve. So I said the pin curve is sensible only if the relative entropy is small. Okay, if the relative entropy starts looking at 2, 3, 10, then uh, the upper bound it gives on L1 distance is trivial. It is bigger than 2. But, uh, the, the, but uh, suppose the relative entropy is finite. Okay. Can you say that the uh, trace distance is, uh, I mean, the L1 distance is not equal to 2? Of course, by the support argument. Because it's finite support of P is contained support of Q, which means that the supports are intersecting. And in that case, that uh, the L1 distance can be, uh, the L1 distance cannot be, it has to be strictly less than P. Okay. So now we can define this argument out here. Okay. So uh, the L1 distance, P and Q, so it is nothing but, uh, 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 the maximum of PS minus QS, where S uh, ranges over uh, subsets of X, the factor of two is there, right? Because if uh, uh, PS minus QS is positive, then P, uh, uh, over S, then over S complement P, P will have less probability than Q because everything has to sum up to that. Anyway, so with the factor of two, this is correct. And now I'm going to apply this, okay? So for Q, I'm going to apply this lower bound, get this inequality, okay? And then you can do some calculus and check what is the value of PS which maximizes this. It turns out uh, uh, the maximizing value of PS is one. Okay. And once I plug that in, I get this. Okay. So this defines our earlier observation. Okay. So any questions about uh, science lower bound, Sanov's theorem? I mean, at least one side of Sanov's theorem, lower bound of Sanov's theorem or, or Pinsker. Okay, so let's proceed. Okay. So what is it that is being said here that if uh, one distribution is uh, concentrated on some subset, then 
and you are given the promise that d1 is uh, not too small then mm. uh, the other distribution cannot also be too small is that is what is being said yeah that is what is being said and that actually justifies the as i said this uh, nomenclature uh, substrate is historical so uh, substrate just means that uh, the 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 distribution q is lower bounded by p scaled down by some factor so i mean in our modern terminology we, we, that factor is basically some kind of dmax okay but uh, i mean when this theorem was proved uh, i mean dmax or dmax epsilon was not a very popular quantity it was unknown to many people in the field so uh, they invented their own nomenclature for it and the name is stuck okay but yes so uh, so saying that the relative entropy is finite is a, is a very strong statement okay not only is it saying that i mean support of this can support it says a lot of quantitative things okay it says uh, that uh, nowhere can p be too much larger than q things like that so that's basically what is uh, stein guarantee out here okay that uh, uh, i mean if if p has positive mass somewhere okay then uh, uh, then then q cannot be vanishingly uh, small with respect to p okay. so there is this lower bound now so so normally i mean uh, sanoff's theorem or stein you, you'll see the asymptotic iod limit of this but that's fine i mean you just uh, take n copies of p n copies of q and uh, uh, i mean look at the d1 of that which is n times the d1 of one copy so that will give uh, 2 to the minus n times uh, uh, the d1 of one copy which is the familiar expression you would have seen okay any further comments so what happens to the epsilon when we take things to asymptotic no so uh, i have n copies but the epsilon remains the same So think of hypothesis testing that the ideal hypothesis p to the power n has to be accepted with probability one minus epsilon, and the uh, imposter hypothesis q to the power n has to be accepted with as low probability. As okay, possible. okay. So epsilon okay. can be brought arbitrarily close. So to yeah, I mean you 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 fix the epsilon and you'll get a bound like this. I see. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I mean in in the usual applications. I, uh the probability of accepting p to the n is 1 minus epsilon okay further questions if not let's proceed so we have seen one application of uh, d epsilon min here already which is uh, stein's lower bound now let us see a nice application of d epsilon max so that application is message compression So what is the problem? So p x y is a probability distribution on uh, the set x times y. Okay. Now it's a joint probability distribution in general, and it's known to all parties. Okay. I mean, the individual probabilities are known to all probabilities uh, to all parties, and the parties can design their algorithms based on this knowledge. Now suppose Alice gets a sample x chosen from the marginal p x from the outside. So this x is coming. into analysis box now she, she wants to send a message m this message m will depend on the symbol x that she has been uh, given and it will also depend upon the instantiation of a public coin okay so what is the public coin public coin is another uh, random variable c with probability distribution pc so this probability distribution is uh, independent of px so if if you are thinking of xyc the joint probability distribution looks like pxy times pc okay so this is the public coin pc independent of uh, this now uh, public means that a sample from this coin is available both to alice and to bob let us say there's some public coin broadcast agency whose uh, job is to uh, take a sample from this distribution and supply it to all interested parties Okay, so the same little c is available at both Alice's end and Bob's end. Now Alice's message 
depends upon hard input X and uh, the coin sample C. We can make it a deterministic function because any private uh, randomness of Alice, I can push into the public coin. Okay. So, I mean, I can redefine my public coin to include the private coins of Alice. Fine, Bob may not want to use that part of the private coin, but it's up to Bob. Okay. So, uh, once you're in public coins, this MXC can be a deterministic function. Now, Bob gets this M, and Bob can also see the coin C. So uh, he, uh, he decodes, okay. So Bob generates a sample Y from M in the public coin. Okay? So this is a deterministic function YMC. Again, Bob could have used private coins, but by the same argument, the private coins of Bob can be pushed into the public coin. Okay, and Alice may not, uh, may choose to ignore it. Okay? Fine, so, so MXC is a deterministic function of X and C. M, uh, YMC uh, is also a deterministic function of MNC. Now, what do I want? I want that the, pro uh, that the probability distribution of Y, okay, for a fixed S. So I'm looking at the sam uh, sample Y. It's a random variable for a fixed X. Why is it a random variable? X is fixed, but remember the, uh, the randomness is coming from the public coin. So the randomness uh, affects M and the randomness plus, of course, uh, the randomness of M affect the output. So just to be clear, uh, the, 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 the distributions looks like PX, PC and PY given X comma C. Well, y given X comma C, uh, yes. PX, PC, uh, then y, uh, y given X comma C. That is the output of this process. That's right. Okay. okay. But of course, uh, Y given X is indirect. It's mediated through N out here. Right, right. There is also there is also an M register there. So so X C M, uh, X C well, M Y C or whatever. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the registers are X Y M and C, and uh, uh, this process gives a probability distribution uh, P X P C, then uh, P of M given X C, which is actually a, a delta distribution. It is concentrated at one point only because it's deterministic. Okay. And then P of Y given MC, which is also delta distribution, because this is a deterministic function. So that's the shape of this probability distribution. Let me write it down. Okay, so this is PX, PC, P, M given XC, P, Y given MC, but uh, So these two conditional distributions, okay, are singlet and probability distributions. This is the picture clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I require, I require that for an average, or if you want for most uh, samples x, the uh, uh, the output of y for the given x should be close to the desired one. So so what is the desired one? If if I had the original probability distribution, this would have been Py given uh, capital X equal to small x. So I want this message compression and uh, transmission procedure to generate a sample Y, which looks roughly, let's say, epsilon close in some measure to this distribution. Now, this may not happen for every X, but I want it to happen for most X chosen from this margin. Okay. Or I want it to happen for a typical X chosen from this margin. So that's what I want. Okay. So the question here is, how short can this message M be? So that's why message compression. So naively, of course, uh, like uh, Alice sees X, okay? And she just generates uh, Y depending on X, okay? According to this probability distribution and transmit. Hello. So, uh, yeah. I didn't get a goal. So I mean, compression, like you would want, 
we wouldn't we would want bob to recover the message with high probability or something like so recover the no 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 the, the, i don't want to recover bob doesn't want to recover x bob wants to generate a sample y okay okay, okay. whose uh, distribution is roughly like this. okay so then this is not message compression right this is more like uh, drawing correlated samples uh, using uh, well, it, is it, it is message compression if you uh, look at this slide so the, so the naive strategy would have been alice okay for that alice doesn't uh, need a public coin i mean alice uh, just by private coins can generate a sample y according to this distribution p of y given x okay and then she also... Uh, and then also, okay sorry yeah go ahead sorry, yeah. sorry. and then and then she'll send the, the sample y generated from the true distribution this will require log y bits so so log y bits suffice for the message and in fact epsilon will be zero out for every x this message will be distributed according to y given x equal to x now i want to compress it. so this justifies the name message compression so i want to compress from the naive strategy by by doing this but I have to pay a price, the price will be the public price. Okay, and there'll be a small uh, error problem. So, Pranav, just to be clear, uh, the, the naive strategy is as following, right? So, Alice has a sample from the X distribution, which is private to her. That is a private part. And the public randomness is that uh, uh, is a sample drawn from the uh, uh, conditional distribution Y given X, which Bob also knows. So, Alice just points out, ki, yeah, this is the register uh, where uh, if you if if you look at this register of y y given x, uh, you get the y corresponding to the correct x, and that requires log y bits. This is the knife protocol, right? No, no, knife protocol is not a public coin protocol. I mean, you can of course implement it with public coins because private coins can be made public. Right. But it's e easier to think of it as a private coin. Knife protocol. Alice is given a little x. She generates a sample y from. Uh, so let me write it down. So she generates a sample y. From the from the conditional distribution and just yeah. sends and it generate okay. y distributed according to p of y given x. This is a knife. Okay. I didn't get Shantan's protocol. Uh, can you? Could no, you... no. So, so this is the correct protocol. Yeah, this is the correct one. I'm fine with this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shantan said this is public coin, but this is actually a private coin. So Alice is given x, and she just generates a sample y from this distribution. Okay. And okay. transmits that sample, but this will require log y bits to do. Okay. So this is the message in the naive protocol, and if I want to compress it, the question is, can I do better? Okay. So so the naive protocol is a public coin protocol. I want to uh, compress it using public coins. So I'm allowing a stronger resource now with uh, public coins. Okay. And the question is, can I can I go below log y? Is the problem clear to all? Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, so I was wondering, like over here, uh, C is some random variable that both of them receive. And I mean, yeah, just uh, saying some thoughts, okay? So uh, uh, the conditional distribution P Y condition on capital X equal to small x, this is some distribution on Y. Uh, as Wondering if there is a function which transforms this random variable C to the random variable Y conditioned on capital X equal to small x. And if there's a way to give the description of that function as message in some form. That's what I was trying to say, but I don't. I, I don't very, yeah, very good, Neha. That's exactly what we're going to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah of course. So. So, further uh, comments? So, I just have one question. PC, the, the shape of PC is known, as in what PC looks like shape is known. Shape of PC is known. Shape of uh, uh, PC, of course, depends upon PX. Yeah. Shape yeah. of PC is known. So, so uh, the choice of this function, nx given C, has full knowledge of the shape of X, uh, PXY in the shape of PC and similarly uh, are we going to do rejection sampling of course yeah yeah so Shantan of course knows the protocol 
but uh, for others, uh, I mean, they may have seen something like this, not, but anyway, I mean, it's good and instructive to do it using our uh, notation. So just uh, 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 just yeah, just before you, uh, before you proceed, I, I this, this this just for me. So this is the AGMR protocol, right? AGMR means what? A HMR, uh, Harsha Jain McAllister. No, person. no, this is this is not that. Protocol. This is an earlier protocol. Uh, Harsha Jain uh, McAllister and uh, who else was there? Yeah, Radha Krishna. Jai Kumar. Uh, Jai Kumar. Jai Kumar. Yeah. No, no. AJ Harsha Jain. M is what McAllister and, and R, R is Radha Krishna. Yeah, right. So that protocol is like this, but uh, there is no epsilon here. So that's uh, so that protocol. Uh, I mean, uses varying message lengths. Okay, because uh, there is, the epsilon is zero. Okay, so they really want to produce a sample according to uh, uh, y given x. Okay, so they use public points. Lots of them. Okay, and uh, and uh, depending on the public file, the message can be short or long, and the result says that the average length of a message is basically the mutual information plus some uh, much smaller terms. Okay. So, so that is the paper, the communication complex of correlation. Okay. But here, I am allowing an epsilon. So, in that sense, this is a less stringent requirement. Okay, but here I'll have messages of a fixed length. And I want to, uh, I mean, another way of putting it is that I want to bound uh, the length of the worst message. And, I, and that should be less than log one. Okay. Whereas the AGMR, uh, the, the, the worst length of the message is infinite. Okay. But uh, the average length of the message, there is uh, the, the Shannon mutual information between X and Y, plus some little low terms, much smaller. So this is, an, this is an earlier work. Of course, oh, uh, so, okay, got so, it, got it. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it inspired a JMR in a sense, but yeah. Okay. So uh, a JMR protocol was done when I taught uh, the basic information theory course uh, to Shyamthan. It's, it's a very nice paper. I encourage you to read it otherwise. Okay, it's, it's also a one short paper, but in this course, we will not be doing it. Uh, Okay. Any further uh, comments? I should also write uh, since the query has been raised. Uh, So okay. over there, uh, the sampling is also perfectly correct. In a JMA. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. I mean, they use uh, basically an infinite public coin, and they keep sampling, keep sampling, keep sampling from the public coin till some good criteria are met. So that starts increasing the message length. Yeah. Okay. So so it becomes perfect in the asymptotic. So in that sense, it's what is called a Las Vegas algorithm. An algorithm whose running time in the worst case can be infinite, but whose average is under control. Okay. Whereas uh, here we want to say the worst case message length is small. Okay. And we are paying the uh, price. So we have to pay a price if we want to bound the worst case message length. So the price we are paying here is this epsilon. Okay. So this is called the Monte Carlo uh, randomized algorithm philosophy. Where the worst case is under control, but there are error probabilities. The Las Vegas one, there is no error probability, but uh, the worst case is infinite. It's only the average that is under control. So, yeah, is the model clear? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are going to work with variable length messages. No, actually, the message lengths will be fixed as you see. 
Okay, so let's go ahead. Yeah, so as Shyamalan guessed, we are going to use rejection sampling because I mean we know the JMR. Okay, so the answer is we can compress down to this quantity. So uh, actually, I, I'm going to change it. So let us say okay, this is this might be this is the most sophisticated thing, but anyway. So forget the delta, okay, can compress down to I max epsilon, uh, okay, uh, bits. So what is I max epsilon? I max epsilon is uh, D max epsilon of the joint uh, probability distribution on XY with respect to the product of the margin. And uh, like the, and in fact, I mean, you can even, uh, um, you can even give upper bounds on IMAX in terms of log Y. So if it was Shannon mutual information, I know it's less than log Y. If it is max mutual information, it can be slightly larger than log Y, but not by much, okay? But uh, usually, I mean, the, the probability distributions I mean, that you commonly see, this quantity is much, much smaller than log Y, which should not be unfamiliar because usually the mutual information is much, much smaller than uh, the naive upper bounds. So that's where the gain will come, that this will be usually much smaller than log. And we'll do this by uh, rejection sampling. Okay. So rejection sampling is a tool used in uh, uh, like uh, statistical sampling algorithms. So we are going to study it in detail. Is the statement clear? So what will come down to? We'll come down to I max epsilon, okay? The max uh, mutual information, the smooth max mutual information with the excellent. Okay, so here is the algorithm. Okay, so, so I have the smooth max mutual information, right? Uh, that's what I want, I max epsilon. So, which was defined in terms of D max epsilon. So, because a smooth quantity, for, uh, what I have to do is, I will not evaluate D max for this thing. I will evaluate D max for uh, the, the ideal distribution, the first distribution slightly further. So I'll be evaluating uh, the uh, dmax, not the smooth dmax, the non-smooth dmax for p prime on x y, and here the second one will be of the old one p x times p y. So that's the definition of uh, uh, the smooth dmax. So let p prime be the vector attaining the optimum in the definition of uh, i max epsilon. Okay. So. Uh, the requirement was that uh, the vector uh, uh, p prime should be less than or equal to p, point was less than or equal to p, and the L1 distance in p prime and p is less than epsilon. Okay, that's fine. So we're we going to work with p prime. The public coin consists of many IID samples, y1, y2, y3. Right now, I'm not telling you how many samples I will need. We will see that in a few slides. So I have many uh, the IID samples drawn from p1. Py, the marginal with respect to the original distribution. So let's look at the picture. So this is the public one, y1, y2, yi, yi plus one goes on and on. So these are IID samples drawn from the marginal P1. Alice will analyze them one by one. She'll first start with y1, okay, analyze it. Then uh, uh, if required, go to y2, analyze it. If required, go to y3, so on. So what does she do? Using independent private coins, she accepts the ith sample yi with this problem. So let us stare at this problem. So remember P prime was the optimum for the D max epsilon. So this ratio P prime X Y I divided by the product of the marginals with respect to the original P. So, uh, so the upper bound of this ratio is two to the I max. Remember uh, P prime is the smoothing uh, uh, probability sub distribution. So for every X comma Y, this ratio will be less than or equal to two to the i max. I think you mean i max epsilon because you're no, using. P. I, I defined it out. I max. Right? I mean, it is oh, i max okay. epsilon. Yeah, yeah, only. yeah. So just for short. Yeah, it, it is that uh, i max only. So for every x comma uh, y, uh, but this ratio is less than two to the i max. If you further divide by two, uh, two to the i max, this uh, quantity is less than or equal to one. So I can think of it as a probability. So Alice's strategy is accept yi, okay, with this problem, something between zero and one. 
if y is rejected, Alice proceeds to the next sample, y i plus one, and so on. So she starts with y one, does this procedure. If y one is rejected, she goes to y two, uses fresh private coins to sample this probability, then sees whether to accept y two or not. Okay. If rejected goes to y3 and so on. Suppose yi is accepted, then Alice will transmit uh, the message mxc equal to i. And Bob's strategy is very simple. Bob will just uh, uh, go to the ith uh, sample in the coin, okay, yi, and he will output that one. Okay. Now you may say that, oh, but uh, uh, Alice's strategy uses private coins and for each sampling, I mean, uh, to do this uh, uh, sampling, except why this problem she uses fresh private coins. But don't worry, uh, we can move these private coins in the public coins, and Bob will not uh, bother about that part of the public coin. Okay. But it's uh, nicest to think of the protocol in this fashion. So the public coin is IID samples from PY, and then Alice uses private coins to do the rejection sampling. This is called rejection sampling. You, uh, you, uh, you keep rejecting. If you accept, then you stop. Okay, and you and you output the index very accepted. Okay, that's the strategy. So is this algorithm clear? Okay. Okay. Good. So let's analyze this algorithm. So uh, many of you may have already seen rejection sampling. So this analysis will not be new to you. But anyway, we we'll just do it uh, with our notation for completeness. So what is the probability that Alice accepts? In the first iteration, I mean, she accepts the first sample. So, uh, so the first sample y1 is generated according to the marginal p y1. This is the problem to acceptance. So we evaluate it and get this quantity. And let's give a name to this alpha x. Okay. And we know alpha x is less than two to the uh, minus i max. That is because p prime x is always less than p x. Remember, p prime was a sub distribution of uh, p. Okay, it was point y is uh, less than or equal to p. So in particular, p prime x will always be less than p. So I get this. And remember, p prime is also close to p. So you can imagine that for most x, this will roughly look like this, two to the power minus i max. So that is the probability of accepting in the first iteration. And what is the probability of accepting in the ith iteration? That means I rejected in the first i minus one iteration. So that is this probability, and then I accept it in the ith iteration. So you can see. The iteration number of acceptance is a geometric random variable with probability of heads being alpha x. So geometric random variable is I toss a coin, probability of heads is alpha x. Okay, remember I'm, I'm working with a fixed x out here. So the, the probability of heads is this alpha x, and I keep tossing till I get a head. Okay, so that's uh, the geometric random variable, and uh, the the iteration number of acceptance is a geometric random variable. And if you ask me what is this probability, I mean, you can essentially say that the probability of heads is basically two to the power minus. So I know how many times I have to uh, toss the coin in order to see at least one head. So it is two to the i max. Okay. And, uh, but anyway, let's analyze that properly. So any questions? Yeah. Uh, should, shouldn't there be, be a, uh, so this probability is acceptance in first I, or ith iteration? Conditioned on x being the sample uh, that came up, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, there I, is a condition in here implicitly. Yeah, that's a condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want that for the given x, the, the final output should look like uh, probability of y given x, right? Yeah, yeah. So x is fixed out here. Or if you want uh, x is, uh, I mean, I've conditioned on a little x. Any other questions? Um, so what if the shared randomness was not samples of y, but some other random variable? Well, so as I said, the, the shape of uh, the public coin uh, depends upon the knowledge of the x, y. So here is a protocol which works with this public coin. Now, if you, uh, if you insist on shooting yourself in the foot with some other public coin, then the performance will be worse. I mean, the, the, I mean, if you want to do rejection sampling, then you'll have to reshape uh, the other distribution. Let's call it uh, uh, some uh, like uh, QC. Okay. I have to reshape QC to look like uh, PY. But uh, then be my guess. But uh, yeah. 
So is it possible to reshape one distribution to another distribution? Like maybe uh, uh, I take some a lot of samples of one distribution, reshape it. To that, is that is that is rejection assumption. Okay, that's yeah, exactly. Okay, some we are doing that, that yeah. in some sense. Yeah. So so the so the answering your question earlier, uh, the public coin is given uh, many samples from P Y, and I will reshape P Y into P of Y given X. Okay, yeah. That's what this rejection sampling is doing. That's what this protocol is doing. It's reshaping P Y to P of Y given X. Is that uh, Okay. So, and the reshaping thing, whatever we get, this will be some approximate version of P Y given X, or yes. will it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. And we are going to analyze uh, to the last epsilon how close this is to P of Y given X. Mm -hmm. And uh, if Y was distributed on some, so does this do these things change with finite uh, alphabet or? infinite alphabet like so, with finite alphabet can things become exact well so in most of the course we are working with finite alphabet so i mean if i don't say then assume finite alphabet. okay but it's not exact uh, Pranab, i have i have one confusion so so what is the uh, termination condition i mean the epsilon will depend on that right because if i let yes, things yes, run yes yes it, it will come to that i mean i mean i'm okay, just starting okay. the analysis Okay, okay. We, we will naturally see how many such samples we require in order to get epsilon probability better. So, but you can imagine if epsilon goes down, I'll need more uh, samples in the public curve. Okay. Good. More questions, please. Okay, if not, let's go. Yeah. So, what we have seen, we have defined this quantity alpha x and probability of accepting in the ith iteration is. Uh, uh given by this so it's a geometric random variable okay now let's calculate so so let us say i have accepted in the ith iteration so the probability that yi is uh, uh equal to some particular symbol y so remember i i want this to look like p of y given x or uh, more precisely i want it to look like uh, uh, p prime of y given x so what is p prime of y given x look at this uh, sub distribution p prime it's on x y then uh, you can define what is uh, p prime x by just uh, summing over all y okay and now uh, p prime of y given x is p prime x y divided by p prime x the same definition okay so what i'm going to prove in this sentence is that given that alice accepts in the ith iteration the probability that bob's output y i is equal to a particular symbol y is exactly what we desire p prime of y given x so here is the analysis so what is the uh, probability of y i equal to y and except in the i iteration so this means that uh, alice has rejected the first i minus 1 iteration which is this and she has accepted in the i iteration with the uh, output y which is exactly this okay, by, by uh, the acceptance criteria and Except in the ith iteration is this probability, which you know. So you simplify it, and uh, this is what you get. Just, just, just one second. So, so the the numerator is uh, the intersection event, right? Acceptance at, yes. at i th and uh, I rejection I for the i i minus i minus one, and the denominator yes. is essentially the uh, conditioning thing that you have yes. rejected for the first time. Okay. Yes. So you can see the numerator has this. So you can simplify it and you'll exactly get this. Okay. So this is quite good. I mean, we are almost there. That uh, a condition on except in the ith iteration, the uh, output of Bob is distributed exactly according to p prime of y given x. Let's go ahead. So, so remember, this was the quantity alpha x. The iteration number of acceptance was a geometric random variable, and we also calculated that probability that y i equal to y given except in i iteration is precisely p prime of y given x. Okay. So now, uh, remember, uh, I'm interested in the final output out here, not the iteration number. So I want to know what is the probability that the final output is y. So x here is fixed. I want to know what is the probability that the final output is a particular symbol y, okay? Summed over all iteration. So, uh, for that, I'm going to do the following. This is the first place where I'll put a bound on the number of samples in the public curve. Okay. 
So, so the number of iterations that Alice is going to work with is upper bounded by this quantity, two to the IMX times something slightly larger, which is two ln one over epsilon. So you know it has to be two to the IMX because even to get one head, the expected number of coin tosses for the geometric random variable is uh, two to the IMX. Remember alpha X is very close to two to the IMX. So this is believable and it's a little bit more because I want the error probability to be epsilon. And you can see that if I want a smaller epsilon, this uh, factor only increases. Okay. okay. So uh, this is nothing uh, but which you can evaluate. So, so I know. For, uh, so to evaluate this, I have to look at the probability that except in first iteration times this conditional probability plus probability except in second iteration times this conditional probability, so on. Okay. But this conditional probability is always p prime y given x, so I can pull it out. And what I have is summation except in first iteration plus except in second iteration plus except in third iteration. These are disjoint events. So this is nothing but one minus probability rejecting uh, these many iterations. So it's exactly equal to uh, this quantity. And this is something that I can write down exactly, okay, which is like this. Yeah. And now I'm going to use this uh, value for alpha. Okay. And I'm going to use the property that uh, one plus y is less than e to the y, very famous inequality. Okay. And then uh, I can say that this expression is upper bounded by uh, p prime y given x times one. I mean, whatever this quantity in the brackets is, is less than one. So upper bound one is trivial. It is lower bounded by this quantity for which I use the inequality for e to the power one. So you can plug all it in, simplify, and this is what you get. Any questions about it? Yeah, so this is something amazing. This says that uh, I fixed y. Uh, sorry, I fixed X, the probability of obtaining a particular symbol Y is very close to P prime Y. Okay. So, I mean, there are upper and lower bounds, very close to each other. So what does this get us? So let's uh, define uh, uh, a symbol P hat X, Y. So this is the probability sub-distribution obtained by rejection sample. Why I'm calling it sub-distribution? There is a chance that even after going to uh, two to the IMAX times two ln one by epsilon samples, Alice may have rejected, in which case she outputs error or she outputs junk. That will go into the final error analysis, no problem. But uh, in other words, uh, I'm allowing the rejection sampling uh, algorithm to fail as far as the analysis in the next few sentences is concerned. So that's why it's a probably some distribution. Okay, so it is very close to a distribution. Uh, the mass of p hat is very close to one. Okay, the gap from one is the tiny probability that Alice rejects all the samples. Okay, so let's uh, so let's uh, uh, okay. So the so the guess is that p hat x y will be close to p. Don't, uh, <clears throat> don't you want to find the difference between uh, p x y and p prime x y because ultimately you want to bound the ratio between p prime x and p x y. No, right? no, no. Ultimately, I want to say that the probability distribution obtained by rejection sampling is close to the original probability. So I want to prove something like this. <clears throat> okay. 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 So this is sub-distribution. Then I'll make it into distributions, but that just causes a, a minor amount of uh, damage. Okay. But essentially, this is what I want to prove. So I'll prove it in two steps. First, I will look at the L1 distance between these two probability distributions. So this is the good old probability distribution, P. Okay. And this is a modified probability distribution where the X is chosen according to the marginal and Y is chosen according to P prime condition. Okay. So I play a triangle inequality like this. So this is the full distribution P prime and so on. And then, I mean, you can see the first quantity is the L1 distance between P on XY and P prime on XY. The second quantity, this P prime Y given X is common here. So when you do the summation in the L1, that all uh, sums out to one. Okay, note that uh, summation over y of p prime y given x is always one, okay? even though p prime is a sub-distribution. So this is equality, and this just boils down to the L1 distance between p prime on x and p on x. Okay. Now we have the uh, monotonicity of trace distance, or whatever, data processing inequality of trace uh, of L1 distance. 
So this L1 distance is less than the first L1 distance. So I can upper bound it like this, just to extend. So is this proof clear? Yeah. yeah. So let's go to the second one. Now I look at uh, P hat, which is what uh, rejection sampling gives me. And I'll compare it to this distribution, the second one out here. Okay. So, okay, so P hat and uh, P look. Uh, uh, did we already not prove that the output, uh, if, whenever acceptance happens? So, hmm. here is a simpler scheme, maybe. So, whenever acceptance happens, we know that the distribution is the correct one. Okay. That is actually it yeah. is P prime, uh, P prime x, y. Yeah. yeah. And with some error, which is. Uh, e power uh, minus p prime x over px. So if we just bound uh, the ratio p prime x over px over some say typical x's, uh, using the difference between p prime x and px is small. Are we not already done? Why are we doing so this? So you can done, but you probably uh, get square root epsilon. So I don't want even to lose that juice. Yeah, we'll get square root epsilon because I have to use a Markov Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as I said, I will not use one. So that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. So what is the probability sub-distribution uh, output of a rejection sampling? So the sample to X is chosen according to PX. And then the output I know is uh, PY, but then there is, I mean, so, so I know what is the output, right? So the, so, so the, so the probability of outputting Y, okay, in, the, uh, in these many iterations, Okay, it's very close to P prime of Y given X, but it lies uh, between this lower and upper bound. Okay. So if I want to maximize the L1, I'll take the lower bound out here, which is this. Okay. And uh, this out here. And then, I mean, this easily simplifies, like uh, P prime Y given X is common. This easily simplifies to this point. So now I'll apply triangle inequality, put these two together, and I'll say that the L1 distance between P hat and P is upper bounded by this. Is this proof clear so far? Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead. Okay. So P hat is the probability subdistribution obtained by rejection sampling. And remember, we had this expression, and now I have to bound this, and I don't want to use Markov. Okay. Well, I, I will use Markov, but a very weak Markov. So uh, define this subset of the sample space X. Where, uh, which is where the ratio P prime X by P X is less than half. Remember P prime X is always less than or equal to P X, but I don't expect it to be much smaller than P X because P prime X is epsilon close. I mean, P prime is epsilon close to P in L1. Okay, so these are really the pathological X's where the ratio is smaller than half. So then what do I know? I know that uh, epsilon is an upper bound in the L1 distance and the L1 distance upper bounded by the gap in probabilities for any subset S. In particular, I choose this as my subset. Okay, I get this. And, uh, but over this subset, you can easily see that the uh, probability mass of the subset under P prime is less than uh, half the probability mass under P. So I get this. In, uh, so this tells me that the mass of the set under the P is less than two epsilon. So this is like a Markov or a reverse Markov, okay. but a very mild reverse. Markov. So now what we get, I get uh, the L1 distance between P hat and P, which was upper bounded by this expression is less than the following. So I split the summation over X into two parts, some over X in S and some over X outside S. When X is in S, this ratio is less than half. So it, it is very small. Let us say uh, it is even zero. Okay, so in any case, this exponential I'll upper bound by one. Okay. So I do that and I get summation Px out here. But when I'm in S complement, what happens? Then this ratio P prime X by Px is not so small. It is at least half. So to upper bound it, I will put in half out here and this will evaluate to epsilon. This X of this whole beast will evaluate to epsilon. I pull it out and I, this is what I get. Okay. Okay, and, and now I know that uh, this is the probability of the set S under P. This is at most two epsilon. Whatever this is, it's at most one. Okay, so upper bound this by one, and I get this five epsilon. So what have I got? Alice's message length 
can be brought down to okay, the log of the number of samples. So I max epsilon plus log log one by epsilon plus one. Okay. And now remember this p hat was sub distribution. There was uh, this uh, probability of the rejection uh, uh, sample failing. In other words, all the samples being rejected. Okay, so that's why it's a sub distribution. If I add that mass back as some error, then the five epsilon becomes 10 epsilon. So the resulting distribution I'm going to call p dot, it's a genuine probability distribution outputted by rejection sample. It is within 10 epsilon L1 distance to t. Okay. So we will uh, stop here today. Any questions? Yeah, is this a scheme close to the HJMR construction uh, in the sense that can I replace P prime with P and wait for it, things it to is, get accepted? It is, uh, it is uh, I mean, similar in the sense that both use rejection sampling, but this is a very naive rejection sample. Okay, HJMR has a much more sophisticated rejection sample. Okay, so okay. The, the first part is the same. The public point is the same. It is uh, like uh, infinitely many IID samples from uh, PY, hmm? then uh, uh, the rejection sampling uh, moves in epochs, okay? So what I've described is epoch one of HJM. Okay. Which goes to roughly the same amount, okay? But then epoch one fails, okay? So here we'll just say, oh, it fails, so we are going to uh, estimate the probability of failure, which is uh, another five epsilon out here, so fine, I mean, uh, I, I pay a price of 10 epsilon and I finish my proof. Okay. But HGMR cannot do it. So they will fail with five epsilon in epoch one. So then they enter epoch two. Okay, so uh, epoch two, again, there are uh, the same sample, but, the, but this probability in the rejection sampling, okay, gets changed. So what they do is that they multiply this probability by two. Okay, two or that, I mean, whatever, any um, a suitable constant larger than. So let us first this is they multiply this by two and then do rejection. So this is by saying that this time I will consider even bigger number of uh, independent samples. Is that what it is? Uh, no, no, they, they, increase, they increase the probability uh, of acceptance. Yeah, so I increase the probability of acceptance. So that means uh, uh, I will not need so many samples. Okay, so I mean, it will become two to the power IMAX minus one out there. Okay. And uh, then uh, uh, like uh, epoch two also fails, calculate the probability, then go to epoch three. Epoch three will be four times this probability. Okay, so th that starts increasing geometry. So, okay. which means that uh, the number of samples to analyze in epoch three is uh, two to the IMAX minus two. Okay, so, Whatever, and then I mean, you, uh, I mean, you keep increasing this probability of accepting appropriately in the right geometric ratio, and this whole thing will sum up to uh, I max plus little o of I max. Oh, so so no, not I max, does not sorry, I max, not I, I, max. I, I, I plus little o. So that's why they have to do this epoch business because the I max is nice enough that wherever for those samples where this ratio is super large. Those samples are essentially done away with. They are, they are cut away from the from the protocol entirely. Yeah. HMR ca cannot do that. That is why that is precisely why HMR has to keep on multiplying to do the I at, yeah. at every epoch to balance out this business. Yeah, balance out. So I mean, the, the ratio where uh, the joint distribution is much larger than the uh, product of the margins. Remember, the sample is coming from the product of the margins. Okay, the, the public coin is coming from the margins, right? And the input to X is PX also in product. So uh, the place where the ratio is very large, that means the product of the marginals is not giving me enough to satisfy the joint distribution. So you have to increase the acceptance probability. But remember that ratio does enter the expression for D1, the good old Shannon relative entry, which is the actual mutual information. Okay. So you can afford to go to epoch two, epoch three, increase the acceptance probability, and waste uh, some more uh, samples simply because I'm not working with IMAX. I mean, IMAX would, would have, uh, as Shandil says, not looked at those uh, symbols at all. But uh, I, the good old Shannon mutual information, does look at those symbols. So I'm willing to pay some extra price because it is allowed by my I. Okay. And you, uh, you pay that extra price, but 
you have to do it cleverly by increasing the acceptance probability. Yeah. And if you keep doing it, you will find that the whole thing sums up to i plus a bit lower power. So there's some cleverness involved in decide, deciding the geometry ratio, but this is it. This is the idea. Okay. okay. And I also lied a little bit. You don't start with uh, exactly this probability. You start off with half of this probability. So the reason behind it is that if you start with this probability, there is only a five epsilon uh, chance of going to second epoch. And if you don't go to second epoch, third epoch, I mean, if you only go with uh, like very little probability like epsilon, epsilon square and all, then the, the sum of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, then, the, the, then the sum of those index lengths. So I want to index a message in epoch one, index a message in epoch two. So the sum of those index lengths will not go to the right point. I mean, uh, the, the, the convergence will be affected. Okay. So actually, I want a non-trivial probability to go to the next epoch. So I actually start off with half of this problem. So there's even trickery there. Okay. It, it, it's a very clever thing. Okay. Okay. So I mean, yeah. It, I mean, there was an earlier avatar of it where it did not start with the half, and uh, they were unable to show convergence to i. I mean, the feeling was there that if you increase the probability, but even that was not enough. Okay. And then came the brilliant idea that start off with the half, then there is a half probability of going to the next epoch, and you can keep it sufficiently high. So if, uh, now this uh, uh, infinite series will converge, and this will converge to i plus this low. So that's about So these are the two new ideas. So you keep increasing this probability, and you start off with half the probability that uh, we see out here. Okay. okay. Any further questions? Okay, if not, uh, I'll see you uh, next week on Tuesday. And uh, I'll stop the recording.